Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Ethics and Society stage at this year's COGX Hybrid Festival. My name is Andrew Straits. I'm your MC for the day and the Associate Director of Research Partnerships at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Ada will be co-sponsoring uh, a series of events and panels across the day today at the Ethics and Society stage, which we are very excited about. If you happen to miss the last panel on vaccine passports and health status applications, don't worry, that will be recorded and published on the website at some point, but we have a really exciting panel coming up for you right now on the future of regulating and, and producing biometrics technologies. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Ethics and Society stage at COGX 2021 and to this session on how do we get biometric based technologies right in the future. Uh, many of you watching will be familiar with the recent rise to prominence of novel biometric technologies like facial recognition and their ability to automate the verification of people's identities in online and real life environments, a crucial requirement in today's societies and economies. These technologies are playing an increasing role in everything from security and policing to retail, health and education. But they have also faced scrutiny from researchers, the media, the public and more, who've all raised questions about the biases and discrimination these systems might perpetuate, as well as the challenges they could pose to civil liberties and much more besides. It's an age old question of how technology should or can push the boundaries of law, regulation and social norms. We're at such an interesting juncture for biometric technologies and what their future might be or should look like. And to help us make sense of the way forward, I'm joined today by two fantastic speakers. Matthew Ryder QC is a founder member of Matrix Chambers Law Firm, a senior advocate and legal specialist in data law and human rights. He was formerly Deputy Mayor of London between 2016 and 2018 and currently chairs uh, a review commissioned by the Ada Lovelace Institute of UK Biometric Law and Regulation in the UK. Willie Dawson is Director of Regulatory and Policy at Yoti, a company that provides online and in-person identity checking and verification. She leads on Yoti's government regulations and on ethics, transparency, data responsibility and security. And she serves on a number of boards, including World Economic Forum's Digital Identity Innovators and Tech UK's Public Sector Board, to name just a couple. Julie also served as an advisor to the Ada Lovelace Institute Citizens Biometrics Council. Uh, I want to welcome them both to the conversation and thank you both so much for joining us today. Before we dive into the conversation, I'll remind our audience that um, you can all pose questions in the chat and please do so throughout the conversation. We have some time marked towards the end where I'll pick up your questions, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out throughout um, if any come in as we go along that I want to throw into the mix. Um, so Julie, Matthew, I want to start um, by getting both your perspectives on the current state of play for biometrics, thinking big picture. What are the top two or three issues, recent events or factors that our audience need to bear in mind as we think about the future of biometric based technologies? Um, Julie, I'll come to you first and then to Matthew. Thank you very much, Aidan. Um, so I'd say generally there's a huge piece of change in this area. And as ever, regulations are likely to lag and then try and catch up. Um, but for me, a couple of the top areas are obviously looking at how tech organisations are open about the levels of bias, and we try to be very clear to minimise discrimination. Another you know, huge topic is obviously look at the surveillance angles, and on the flip side, what the opportunities there are for data minimisation. Um, and across the board, how can we encourage companies to be more transparent and explain more clearly what's under the hood? Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Matthew? Hi, I, I should just probably warn you, uh, as is the way Workman Next Door have just started. So if you can hear loud banging and drilling, that's what that's about. So apologies for that. Um, in terms of the uh, key uh, changes at the moment, I would say that that I would say that the um, law in relation to facial recognition is trying to catch up. I'm, I'm so sorry, I've, I've got a problem on the line. Let, let me, um, uh, I'm going to have to come off for a second and I'll come right back. Okay, well, while Matthew is trying to uh, make sense of the uh, drilling next door, it can happen to, to any of us at any time, I suppose. I'm hoping my next door neighbor's baby doesn't start choosing this moment to cry because then we'll be uh, uh, really all over the place. Um, Julie, while we're waiting for Matthew to come back, um, perhaps we could just maybe turn the conversation to one of the next questions we wanted to go to, which was what is the role of the public in this conversation? I mentioned in the intro that um, you know one of the things that industry actors as well as regulators and the media are, are thinking about at the moment is how members of the public are responding to, reacting to these technologies. It would be great to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on the role of the public in, in the debate around biometrics. Thank you, Aidan. Yes, and I think there's been a tremendous body of work undertaken by Ada over the last sort of 12, 18 months in this area. 
because clearly there's a lot of confusion, there's people that you know are apprehensive, and there's also a fair degree of misinformation. Um, and there's a very broad set of biometrics that people could be interested in or want to learn more about or be confused by. So you've got voice biometrics, face, iris, gait, DNA, heartbeat, all sorts of different types. And some of those are active, some of those are passive. Um, you've got some types of biometrics such as facial, whereby you're looking at many different nuances. It's not just recognition of one person one-to-one, -one. could be one person one-to-many. But then there are other types of facial technologies which are just detecting, is this a face? And then maybe analyzing a face, looking at characteristics such as age, where there is no authentication and there's no recognition. So there's a wide range of different biometric technologies and even within one, such as facial, not all of those are actually recognizing or authenticating. So what's difficult for people and journalists and regulators to look at is that broad set of biometrics. And yet at the same time, um, they have to look at what the different use cases are that are under consideration. And in each instance, there'll be positive and negative intended and unintended consequences around these. So um, I think we've got to get to more granularity and help and assist a wider set of the public understand both the positives and the negatives and how and how can we do that as both tech companies, as industry observers, and as regulators? And those are, I think, some of the key challenges ahead of us at the moment. And I don't know, Aidan, if following on from the Citizens Council, we might see more in this area, but that was a, a tremendous opportunity where you had about, you know, over 100 members of the public over a considerable period, um, really getting up to speed and, and shedding a lot of light as to the public's concerns. So yeah, I think that was a tremendous body of work and it would be interesting, I think, maybe some on the call haven't heard how that panned out. Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, it, 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 I wish it were 100, it wasn't quite, it was 50 people, but nevertheless a substantive number. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like Matthew's just um, just joined us back. So hopefully, I mean, we couldn't hear the drilling too bad, Matthew, but I appreciate it, it might have been bouncing around your head in there a little bit. Um, Matthew, if, if you want to come back in, it'd be great to hear your kind of top uh, two or three uh, kind of thoughts on, on the big picture of where we are with biometrics at the moment. Uh, I'm afraid, thank you, I'm, I'm sorry about that interruption. I'm afraid I'm going to be uh, a little bit uh, more downbeat about the current state of play. I think there's already a problem. I think the use of biometrics uh, quickly advanced ahead of um, a situation where it was being regulated properly and uh, law enforcement and private companies were using biometrics in a, in a situation where it was not well regulated and where they were able to effectively go through the regulation or whatever lack of regulation there was in order to do what they wanted with biometric data and biometric data collection and sharing subject to only kind of much more high level data general data protection kind of regulation. I think that's a real problem because it's a uh, we've had a history a 20 year history, which we should have learned from, of tech companies and governments uh, being able to get ahead of regulation. And by the time the regulation catches up, practices have been embedded and we've got to a situation where it's very, very difficult to regulate. So law and regulation is really important. The law is starting to catch up, but it's, it's slow and it's behind. The regulatory system isn't really fit for purpose. Most of the people we've consulted is in the work for my review have um, have agreed it's the regulatory system isn't working efficiently. There are some problems in the way we understand biometric data. And so we still think of it largely through the prism of personal data used for identification, which is how we understand data protection regulation. Whereas uh, we, we've heard from this morning's um, panel, and we'll be hearing more, I'm sure, during this um, conference, that categorization of people healthy, not healthy, by, the, by different other behavioural characteristics or other types of categorization, is a very common way biometrics are used and will be used, and that needs a different kind of understanding than our classic data protection understanding. And then I think uh, I, I have, and we can explore this in a bit more detail, I have real concerns, very strong concerns, about thinking that simply giving greater transparency by tech companies and by the government, and simply by engaging the public more so that the public understand better what's going on. 
I don't believe that's a solution. And I think that is in many ways uh, buying into a flawed process. You have to engage the public. You have to bring them along. That's a given. But the idea that you can judge the safety or the uh, appropriateness or the ethical use of biometric data by how well the public understands it or by how transparent, how much you tell people is the exact trap that we've fallen into with the, the data aggregators that have become these huge companies that dominate world economies. And therefore, we must have a different way of understanding how we engage with the public and not relying on public understanding or transparency in order to be able to say, well, that will give us the gauge of where we should run. So I think that's a challenge that even politicians and those in this area have yet to step up to. Thanks, Matthew. And I just wanted to pick up, I mean, uh, I think those points you made there, Ad, it's not just about, um, it's not just about boosting public understanding, it's about kind of meaningful engagement, bringing them along the journey, but it's also about regulation and ensuring that, you know, the, the kind of hard aspects of, of how we form a social contract around these technologies are, are, are keeping pace. Um, I just want to pick up on, on one quick question then, Julia, I'll, I'll come back to you. But um, it seems that facial recognition has been the biometric technology of, of the day. It's been the one that has dominated conversations in media, in, in, in research, in, in, in policy as well. How important is it that we expand um, the notion of biometrics beyond just one subset of these technologies to, to include other ones as well? Well, I do absolutely agree that it is important that we look at facial recognition and the surveillance angle. Absolutely. However, I think that there are a clear set of other use cases where a facial technology is not recognizing. And I think that nuance seems to be, at the moment, um, very poorly understood. So there are instances whereby, if you just look at um, the, the one area of assessing age, we've got over a billion people on the planet that do not have a root identification document, but a facial biometric could be used to assess this as a real human and to assess age. And in that instance, it's not reviewing anything about the identity of the individual. The data sets are just built from an anonymized face, month and year of birth. So that is, for instance, just one small example whereby actually if, if, if that is bundled together with a facial recognition, it, it, it's, it, it's not comparing like with like. Um, I think there are other instances as well where we need to review is something actually having a benign or a malign impact. Um, and that is not at all to, to play down the element that there needs to be correct oversight. And that's where I think some of the, the, the mechanisms could be reviewed that actually look at how do regulators work in tandem with industry um, and look at potentially areas such as sandboxing as, as, a, as a way forwards. But yeah, I would say that that one example is, is probably quite a simple one to help people think about the breadth of technologies under the facial side, detecting analyzing or characterization versus anything that actually recognizes this is Julie coming back on a one-to-one -one, or this is Julie's face amidst 20,000 faces maybe at a football match or other and those are, are quite distinct. Those could for instance help in, in an area such as retail where you might want to give people several different options in order to prove age given that we have just in the UK 24% of adults with no photo ID document it could offer people in such an instance if they chose to actually have their age assessed in that way um, and there are other instances otherwise online that that could also help with where the image is instantly deleted and no data is retained um, retained but that is just one use case so I wouldn't want to spend a whole session on that but I think it's quite a useful one to explain thank you maybe if, if I could make a point on that agent so I think Julie makes a good point about how the um, the use cases and the types of way we have we use biometric technology can be nuanced and therefore that you know if you're talking about facial recognition the, the classic case that we all understand and which is for example in the EU AI regulation put as a kind of prima facie impermissible use is the normal or, or the, the, the kind of thing we all understand of a facial recognition technology being used on the public to, for the police to try and identify members of the public in a public space. And that's the kind of high level example that's considered to be at the, the most unacceptable subject to some exceptions and very, very tight safeguards. The problem though is that 
if you allow uh, biometric technology, which uh, is uh, being used in a way that's supposed to have a lot less intrusion, you have to ensure that you don't open the door to exceptions to the normal case use that essentially undermine the entire basis upon which you're allowing that kind of more limited use to take place in the first place. Because in, our, in, in the regulation in relation to data and potentially in relation to biometric data, we're seeing a situation where uh, governments or, or legislators or com tech companies can say, look, we want to use only a very limited case. We'll destroy at this point. We won't use for this purpose. But then the legislation builds in a, a range of exceptions that allow retention in some circumstances, allow different use in other circumstances, and so on. And so the solution to that can be much harder edged rules than we would normally expect to see in a regulatory environment because both governments and tech companies are so adept at gaming the rules. They're so brilliant at finding a way through exceptions and finding a way in order to be able to make something that you wouldn't think is the case use to become the case use. Now, that, that doesn't necessarily happen malevolently or deviously. It happens because they are, they, they are bombarding the rules, the regulatory system with, okay, what is, what is it actually saying? And, and is this actually prohibited? And in doing that, they are t stress testing it for what is a case we can use that might fall within an exception or find some way to be able to do something which on the face of it, you wouldn't normally be allowed to do. And so that's why I agree that we have to understand there are nuanced technologies within this, but it's why I would err on the side of harder regulations, which then get softened, rather than allowing a, a relatively permissive regulatory regime uh, with, with lots of exceptions or allowing, uh, allowing people to be able to sort of weave their way through in order to have a case use that they say is useful that can actually become quite destructive. And, and Matthew, just picking up, oh, sorry, Angela, I'll come back to you in one second, but I just wanted to ask Matthew, because Julie, you mentioned um, this, that, you know, regulators and, and technology companies working together and thinking about novel ways forward, for instance, things like sandboxes. Matthew, do you think there's a space for that more collaborative approach? I think what you outlined there is um, there's, there's a potential, I don't want to use the, I'm trying to find out what the right word is, but it seems that those things aren't working in tandem. It's, it's regulators and industry kind of butting heads, but is there a way to be more collaborative? No, see, I, I take from the work that we've done and, the, and the, the evidence that we've taken, I take a little bit of a different view about that. We are always presented with a paradigm of regulator against, uh, you know, for example, tech company, and it's impossible. And if only we could all work together and there was much greater collaboration, it would be great. We need to shift the window a bit. There is a lot of collaboration. There is already a huge effort by the ICO and other regulators to reach out and find sandboxing systems or whatever it is to enable tech companies to work. There is a huge emphasis on the benefits of AI for business, and rightly so, and the benefits of AI for the economy. If anything, we need a readjustment the other way. We need regulators to say, we're not always going to be defaulting to try and find a useful way tech companies can work with, that we can work with tech companies. We have to get comfortable being in a situation where saying, this is a hard line, you can't cross it. And worse and more significantly that, legislators have to be comfortable with that. Not just regulators, legislators have to be able to say, this is a hard line, you cannot cross it, work within that. In my own view, uh, Julie obviously has, has far more experience she, 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 um, um, in, in her area, but my own view is that good actors in this space, and I would include Yoti in that, if I may say so, good actors in this space like the lines. They like to know where the lines are so they can do the creative magic stuff they want to do within those lines. But giving people hard lines and saying, this is the line that you cannot cross, I think is helpful rather than hindering. And of course, you can always reassess those and you can always readjust those if a good case is made to readjust the line. Is made to readjust the line. Thanks, Matthew. Julie, back to you. Yes. Um, so I do think, however, one of the things that tech companies are trying to do is a bit like Peter and the Dyke, plug some things whereby the genie is, is already out of the room. 
and plug some huge issues that are already there that predate. It's almost as though, um, Matthew, I always got the impression of thinking you're sort of finding ways to use the tech, whereas actually if, if I look at a couple of the issues such as how, how do policing today review CSAM material? How does one police force with a limited number of offer, um, officers do case review to ascertain the ages of victims and perpetrators in child sexual abuse material? Or how does the platform with you know 40 to 100 million users actually review the ages if they're trying to upcoming meet something like the age appropriate design code? And in a way, what tech companies can be doing is trying to look at what is the arsenal of approaches that can help in the already existing areas. And that's this healthy tension between actually looking at um, you know, what are the potential solutions, what's the tech in the armory to meet that. I mean, fraud is a key one, and safeguarding are the ones that, that we tend to look at. Um, I would agree that some lines are useful, but at the same time, if you're trying to find innovative approaches, that's where I think, in a way, the sandboxing is really helpful. Because what you don't want is companies coming up with technology, spending five years innovating, and then finding, oh, there's no way you can actually use that. You're not then incentivizing that research and development to meet the issues. So that's why I would urge more on the, the area of if we want companies to come up with solutions for some really horrible um, you know, issues that are out there, we have to provide scenarios and frameworks such as sandboxes to encourage that innovation. Because specifically looking at the fraud actors and, and the bad actors in the um, child protection area, they're not bothered about that at all. They're not waiting for lines, you know, that is moving ahead. And, and that I think is the, the area that reg tech companies are trying to work in to see where the regulations are evolving and how can they meet that, that sort of um, gap in between what is needed and the regulations. So it, it seems to me, and, and you are both far more uh, expert than I am in, in this area, so uh, forgive me if I'm kind of getting this wrong, but it feels to me that we're coming back to this question of, of the pace of technology and the pace of, of, of regulation kind of aligning neatly, there is a sweet spot that needs to be found between enabling uh, as you say, Julie, uh, companies to be able to find that space to innovate, to tackle solutions that society faces and so on. But Matthew, as you say, making sure that there are clear boundaries within which um, technology companies should operate. And that, in fact, those clear boundaries being, a, being a, um, a kind of enabler of innovation because it means you're not straying one way or the other and, and, and kind of stepping toes out. Like that's that kind of old phrase, isn't it? You know, brakes were invented to allow the car to go faster. It's that kind of thing. And, and so I guess the, the question I have for, for both of you, and Matthew, I'll come to you first, is what does that, you know, can we reach that sweet spot? What does it look like? And for biometrics in particular, if we don't find that that right way forward, what are the what are the risks of both, um, you know, of both innovation going going too far and, and, and causing potential harms, but also what are the risks of not being able to tackle some of the solutions that these technologies might offer to society? So I think the search for the sweet spot is a given. I think everybody in this space understands that. It's the uh, constant uh, balance that government, regulators and private actors are doing in all kinds of business spheres and, and have been doing in tech for a very long time. So I don't think there's anything new, complicated or especially tricky in, in the concept of a sweet spot. Getting there is obviously the, the critical issue. Now, um, where there is a problem is that we have to learn from the past. We have global data aggregators who have gained regulation globally and are continuing to gain regulation globally for decades. And they have harvested data for decades and been able to avoid regulation for decades. And now the trend you see is they lean into regulation. All the major data aggregators are telling the world they want more regulation. And the reason in my respectful view that they want more regulation is because they don't fear regulation. They are confident that they can have regulation that will allow them to do, still do what they want to, in order to progress their business model. Now, in some respects, that's good because it means we have a permissive uh, regulatory system that allows technology to develop. But we have to ensure that we don't fall into the traps of the past. So what are we trying to avoid? Well, we're trying to avoid the normalization of the harvesting of biometric data. We're trying to avoid false distinctions 
in the categorization of biometric data. And what I mean by that is that we still have a very big difference between data, biometric data being used for identification purposes and biometric data being used for categorization purposes. And that very big distinction is sometimes presented in the regulatory, in the regulatory framework as bigger than it needs to be. There can be serious infringements of your privacy from categorization in exactly the same way as identification. The regulatory framework needs to reflect that adequately. It reminds me a bit of the, the lessons we learned on surveillance when there was huge regulation and prohibition on the content of communications, but very little regulation on the metadata around communications. And it was only you know, as, as late as 2014 and 2015 that, that everybody was saying, actually, metadata can give you as much information about people as content in many circumstances. Thirdly, bias and discrimination, that has to be resolved. And it isn't resolved simply by people saying, we're trying to do the best we can. Or, and it isn't resolved by people saying, until you can prove there's bias and discrimination, we should be able to use it. I've had experience of this in the public sector, when you need to put the onus on those who potentially are using um, discriminatory uh, biometric uh, data and, 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 and technology. The onus is on them to prove it isn't discriminatory, not the other way around. Fourthly, there needs to be ethical oversight and ethical engagement. Companies and public authorities need to have access to those who are experienced in dealing with ethical issues around the use. Because it's not just, for example, statistical bias, it's also ethical use that needs to be regulated. Uh, fifth, we need to avoid regulatory arbitrage. And so we can't have a situation where people are bouncing between regulators with, with not being sure which regulator is actually the one that should be looking at this. And we do have a problem with that within the UK regulatory framework. And it's called, it's a global problem. If you can bounce around your regulatory, if you can have regulatory arbitrage in the way you have taxation arbitrage, you have a serious problem that enables some place in the world to be havens for a certain use which would be prohibited elsewhere. Uh, two other things, I'll be quick, but uh, the inevitability, we have to consider the inevitability that once data is gathered, it will be used and can be used for national security surveillance. That's just a fact of the UK legal framework, and that means we have to understand that whenever we're being permissive about something. And finally, um, I would say one of the harms we're really concerned about, and my review has been concerned about, is the overstatement of public, public consent, the overuse of public consent, the, the, the gaming of public consent as a way of being permissive about use in the, uh, on the basis of the public and properly understand when they give permission for something and when they don't. To some degree, the public will, but we have to also understand there's a real limitation on that. Sorry, that's a lot, but that, those are the harms that I thought were important that we're trying to address. Thank you. I, th I think you've, you've laid that some of those concerns out incredibly clearly there. And Julie, I know that this is these are all things that Yoti are thinking about as well. And, and Matthew's mentioned before, you know, it's, this is th these things are, are not new topics to Yoti. So how do you view some of these issues uh, in, in the work that you are doing? I think as a small company, when we were just 50 or so people, um, we actually set up early on an ethical framework and set up an external guardians council looking at people with, with experts from the human rights side, consumer rights, last mile tech, online harms and accessibility. This is a group that now meets quarterly, terms of reference and minutes published openly. And we've mirrored this with an internal group of people throughout the company and trying to encourage them to build the antennae to say when they're not happy about something or to thrash an issue around, a little bit like you might have in a, in a jury scenario, but effectively upskilling the, the staff internally to ask awkward questions. And I think, in the same way as when we have people doing medical degrees, looking at ethics, we need staff in technology companies to have that training as part of their induction, um, because you can't go far enough. The ethical oversight has to go both top down and bottom up. Um, and I would thoroughly agree with those areas that Matthew described, that we need this openness with regards to the discrimination and bias, but that has to also be independently reviewed. So finding expert benchmarkers, people look, that look at bias analysis, such as Dr. Alison Gardner's work from Keele University are, are really helpful elements. Um, and taking part in the regular and early stakeholder engagement opportunities, be that through bodies such as ADA or by companies working with bodies such as the Biometrics Institute and following their frameworks, which are encouraging companies to do that. And ahead of regulation, I would hope 
that people that are buying the technology look for that under the hood. They look for that oversight, they look for the stakeholder engagement, and they look for that third party review that companies are doing what they say they're doing. Thanks, you. And, and my, my next question was, was actually going to be what can those that want to innovate and use these technologies uh, be thinking about and trying to do? But I think what you've just outlined there are some really interesting um, kind of steps and, and, and things that organisations can be doing. And I guess maybe if I flip the question around slightly then, and, and Julie, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you uh, back on this. But it, I think what we've done in this conversation is we've outlined a huge number of, of challenges, questions that, that need to be figured out. And that the, the topic of this conversation was how do we get the future of biometrics based technologies right? And so from your perspective, what else is needed to help kind of smooth this process along and make sure that there are the right checks and balances and, and to support those organisations that are trying to do the right thing, but also make sure that regulation is, is keeping step and creating those clear boundaries within which to work. If there was a kind of magic wand you could wave to say, this is what we need, what might that look like, Julie? Um, this might be controversial, but I think similarly we need the same degree of educa education and nuanced understanding within our regulators. If I look across the different bodies in, in, in the UK that could be, for instance, um, reviewing a topic such as an age verification, this is something whereby you might have staff moving on, but literally there's a, a body of several hundred people that need this degree of, of nuanced understanding of the different approaches to be able to ask the hard questions understand and ask, for instance, how is this um, consented data created? How is it updated? Who reviews it? And we also need to have more investment in bodies. If you look at NIST in the US, you've got an entire campus of several thousand people that actually undertake detailed review analysis and benchmarking. We don't at the moment really have an equivalent of that. In Europe, we have a small body in the UK that thankfully has been set up in the last year or so. Um, but that's still quite a, a minimal amount of expertise to be reviewing and giving critical analysis on a detailed level. Um, so I'd say, referring back to Matthew's point, yes, that line has to be clearer, because at the moment it's not super clear, even for companies that want to do things the right way. Um, and you have, to have, you have to have benchmarking approaches that go across the geographies that you want to work in. And the regulators that you're dealing with in different countries, you hope they're able to understand the reviews that you've taken that have, you've undertaken in other countries. So innovative companies are, are looking, how can I roll out this technology in different, regulate, in different regulatory regimes? And how can I do the right thing? So unless the regulators are asking the right questions and we have independent bodies doing that research, we're, we're still in a, in a chicken and egg position. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to um, embarrass Julie on, on, the, on the call, but what I would say is that, um, you know, the fact that Julie's here and is is engaging with this is a real testament to a company like Yoti, who are making a, a really strong effort to try and, you know, as Julie's explained, develop ethics panels, you know, do, do things within the company that are the right kind of practices. But that is just not a, a, an appropriate mechanism by which we expect an industry to, to function, that we expect everybody to be like Yoti or we expect everybody to, to, to self-regulate. It's just not an efficient or even workable way to do it because for every IoT, there's going to be 10 companies that are trying to get everything they possibly can in, in the genuine belief that if we, if we play within the rules, that's okay. And so they're, they're pushing the rules to their absolute limit, doing the absolute minimum, stretching every single angle because in their view, until there's a hard, until we run up against a hard line and somebody within our legal team or somebody at regulatory says you cannot do it, why can't we do it? So the reality is, is that we have facial recognition technology that is not appropriate to use, being regulated in its use by self-imposed bans at the moment by Microsoft, IBM, uh, Google, have, have put self-imposed bans. Bans work. Bans have stopped police using technology they shouldn't be using. But the ban has been imposed by the technology companies themselves. And one might say only because of a slightly unusual set of circumstances last year, which brought the discriminatory use of, of technology in all sorts of ways to a, to a massive public um, uh, attention. So that isn't the right way for us to be regulated. We can't have vaccine passports or COVID tracking apps regulated by Apple and Google saying, 
uh, we're not going to allow these to be supported on our phones if you use a, a, a centralized system. And that prevented a centralized system from taking place. So what needs to be done? It does need informed legislation, legis an informed legislature and informed regulatory framework. It needs more resources within the regulatory framework and it needs both a, a regulator and a legislator who, who are able to draw on specialist knowledge and are in a position where they can update their specialist knowledge and, and are willing to, if necessary, go head to head in stopping innovation from happening. Because they, they will say, for example, in the, facial, in the facial recognition sphere, until you can sort this out, we cannot allow you to use it. And that sometimes needs to happen. It, I know that's a horrible sort of uh, prospect for innovative technical uh, technology businesses, but sometimes that has to be done for the long-term benefit of making sure these industries develop appropriately. I think, uh, thank you, Matthew. I, I, I wanted to pick up briefly on this question of, of bands and, and you said bands do work. We know bands work. And I, I think um, it, it's really interesting that Microsoft, IBM, Amazon uh, uh, kind of have placed these self-imposed bands or, or perhaps moratorium. You know, it's, it's perhaps time limited. I think one of them, I can't remember which, said a ban until the regulatory framework is, is set out more clearly. A, a challenge, I guess, is are bands too blunt an instrument for something that is as complex as biometrics as we've been discussing so far? There are many different technologies, many different applications. They can be used for identification versus categorization and, and many other things besides. Are they too blunt an instrument for, for something as complex as biometrics? Um, I think if you're going to ban something, you need to be pretty, you need to be on pretty strong ground as to why it's unacceptable and it needs to be pretty narrow in scope. You've got to make sure that you are not in, in an attempt to deal with one particular problem, creating a ban across a, a wide range of uses or a wide range of technologies that should just not be included in it. So a, a ban is a blunt instrument um, and it's an extreme measure. But those things, when you can identify a problem, and you're not able to get an industry to pull back from it voluntarily, then that needs to be a, a weapon within the arsenal of the regulator. And, and the legislature similarly needs to be confident in saying, we cannot allow this to be used in this way until you can make it a safe technology. Now, there is, there is, there is just one thing I should say about regulation, which is that we do have a problem with, with, with the kind of paradigm of regulation we have at the moment, which is we have legislation that which deals with process, and we have regulators which largely deal, are largely comfortable dealing with outcomes. In other words, is this the right outcome? But what we don't have is that bit in between where a regulator will say, you, you, have to, you can't do it this way, or, or this particular uh, way you want to do it has to, be, has to be accompanied by certain safeguards. And that is very difficult for those who work in that industry to accept because they need that flexibility. But at times, we have to grapple with the fact that you, do, you are going to have to rain back some innovation in the sake of safe evolution of the product. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, there's a there's some number of questions coming in from, from the audience there. I just want to pick up on one, and, and Julie, I'll, I'll ask you about what is the role of, of technology companies in the process of developing the right legislative and regulatory framework? What, what are the limits could be? And picking up on that question of the ban being a, a blunt instrument, um, what, what is a more delicate, nuanced instrument, and what, what role can technology companies play in that, in figuring out what those instruments are? Mm, I think there's an interesting point that Matthew made earlier with regards to size and scale. So your large players will have enough bandwidth and resource to put people forwards for this sort of arbitrage negotiation. Um, quite problematic for smaller companies is, is how to have the bandwidth to engage in that. I mean, we see that patently at the moment with there was development of, of really helpful trust frameworks popping up around the world, but those are time intensive to actually be part of. There's many different standards bodies around the world working on really useful standards. But classically, if you're a smaller company, the same people you've got that are trying to work with your existing and prospective customers and build your products are the same people that you'd want to be sat late at night or early in the morning on these calls. The larger companies have got the bandwidth to do both. And that then makes it really hard to get that, the, the breadth of voices around the table. A classic one at the moment is if you look at, for example, um, putting a driving license on your Apple app um, and using potentially within that some different forms of 
you know, biometrics for checking this is the same person. That type of, of solution, if that were turned on overnight, could de facto bring um, identification onto one of those large scale platforms um, in a way that many individual member states or, or governments would not really think palatable. So it's very hard to get the to get the um, the outcomes that you would like in terms of a range of companies with different, shall we say, moral compasses sitting at those tables. Um, and I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge. We try to be involved in those. We try to be involved in in both giving our input to new trust framework development to um, lots of different consultations around the world. But that's of a company now with 300 people with three or four people trying to look at this globally. That's that's a, a quite a, a hard effort for companies of any smaller scale, and particularly your, your startup and innovative companies, which then puts the power back into um, the larger companies that do have that bandwidth. Thanks, Julia. I, I think all this is kind of just a, a real clear reminder for me, at least anyway, that even when we're, we're, we're kind of breaking down and focusing on a particular subset of technologies within an even broader category of technologies, we still always end up coming back to the nature of, of kind of global technology companies, the, the, the role they play in society, the role that smaller tech companies play within that larger ecosystem. And these are huge questions that I, I think, you know, the whole, uh, not just this session, but this whole conference and many other people are going to be talking about and thinking about. Um, we have, I think, about 90 seconds left. So I might just come back to each of you for kind of a, a final 20, 30 second comment. If there's anything burning that you didn't manage to get off your chest during this session or anything you'd like to pick up on. Matthew, I'll go to you first for your, your final few thoughts. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the questions, if I'm saying, well, there's a problem with uh, actors, and I don't just mean tech companies, I'm talking about governments as well, um, being able to find loopholes or soften or find ways to soften regulation. I, the question, therefore, is what, what's the, the answer to that? The answer is harder edged regulation. The answer is more specific regulation. The answer is regulation that's not so open to interpretation and a regulatory framework which makes it really clear which regulator has responsibility for doing what and and what they can do and and have regulators being comfortable about exercising the harder the, the, the further uh, tougher aspects of the powers that they have they shouldn't be hesitant about that so from my perspective a, a tighter regulatory regime is really important um and i think uh we have to be confident that the use of biometric regulator, biometric data is going to be something which is going to be enormously valuable to all of us. But we have to have some confidence in the, in the actors in this environment that they will innovate and they will come up with amazing solutions within whatever regulatory framework you give them. You just have to give them a clear one and you have Thank to you. about it. Thank you, Matthew. Julie, final quick thoughts from you. Yes, and I, I would like to, as well as that clearer framework, build on the concept of sandboxing, which the UK has uniquely done pretty well with the FCA, now the ICO, and with the Home Office, but try and have more cross-regulator sandboxes and also with bridges to other parts of the world. And that would then enable more companies that are on the right track um, to act, hopefully, as, as, a, as a beacon and to work more to upstream, educate the regulators and create more confidence amongst relying parties of those solutions um, and give more people access to these are the types of um, accreditations and regulatory frameworks that these companies are working within and hopefully that upskills the buy-in community to ask the hard questions and look between companies and decide whether they would rather be working with a company that's worked within the guidelines within the regs and together with the sandboxing um, and hopefully that drives buying power as well fingers crossed Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I think the answer to that question of what does the future look like for uh, for, for biometrics has been pretty thoroughly covered um, by you both there. So Matthew, Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. That That's all we've got time for. Thank you uh, to the audience for, for all of their questions and of course to Project for having us here today. And I'll hand back over to Andrew to play us out of this session. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Aidan. And thank you so much again, Matthew and Julie, for that fantastic and lively discussion.